Well, thank you to the Fatima Center for this invitation to speak. The triumph and reign of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart includes a full restoration of the traditional Mass. There's nothing closer to Our Lady's heart for us than that we should have the Blessed Sacrament and a reverent Mass to worship her Son. The angel who came to prepare for Our Lady of Fatima taught the children the prayer in 1916 that we adore God. And in the second prayer he taught, he showed where, saying we offer the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, the Holy Eucharist. And then Our Lady taught the children in May 1917 to say, Most Holy Trinity, I adore thee. My God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. This is the constant message of the Fatima prayers. And in June 1917, she asked for prayers and sacrifices for the conversion of poor sinners. Now, the conversion of poor sinners is a response to God's conversion on the altar, converting bread into his own being. That's the greatest conversion there is. And this reality cannot be removed from history. It's the purpose of history. People think they can manipulate politics. They cannot remove the traditional Mass and the Blessed Sacrament from the lives of those who seek Him. It can't be removed from creation, though man is rebelling now against nature as never before. We will see how it is written into creation. And in fact, it's at the level of metaphysics which no human being can mess with. That is completely God's domain, that He give us His substance. You know, Scott Hahn has shown very well that the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse, uh, shows to us the liturgy in heaven. It shows us the last things and what happens after the last things, but also what's happening now in heaven and therefore how we connect with heaven through Holy Mass. But this is not only in the last book of the Bible, it's in the first book, Genesis. Even in the Garden of Eden, we can see the roots of the Mass right there. It is an eternal reality and in the center of the Garden of Eden was the tree of life on the mountain. This is the cross and the fruit of the tree of life is the body of Christ on the cross. It is the Holy Eucharist and this is the, the fruit of the Mass which Our Lady wants us to have and therefore her triumph will involve the restoration of the mass of ages. Now God hasn't written the scriptures as a philosophical manual on metaphysics but it's all written there in the most beautiful language if we consider the Psalms. The last Psalm to be prayed today in the Divine Office at Sext was Psalm 103. There we read, God who founded the earth upon its own base it shall not be moved forever and ever. God has laid a foundation to the earth that will not be moved but we know there are earthquakes he's talking about something deeper he's talking about the substance of the blessed sacrament and then Psalm 124 they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion he shall not be moved forever that dwells in Jerusalem it's clearly not talking about the city Jerusalem in the Holy Land Jerusalem is our worship of God those who dwell there will be firm like Mount Zion like a mountain, not move forever with this same stability that God chooses to give to the earth. And Psalm 111, the just man shall not be moved forever. His heart is ready to hope in the Lord. His heart is strengthened. He shall not be moved until he look over his enemies. This strengthening of the heart in another Psalm we hear comes from bread that strengthens the man and wine gives joy to his heart. Now this bread and wine is nothing else than the Holy Eucharist. And therefore, the one who prepares his heart to hope in the Lord, when you prepare to receive Holy Communion properly, you will not be moved until you look over your enemies. We'll come soon to what the enemies 
of God and the church are trying to do in the world, they have no chance. What's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? We can compare it to a landscape, the most beautiful landscape you can imagine. And the Old Testament is that landscape in twilight. And the New Testament is that same landscape in the full light of day, in the light of Christ. Once you shine the light of Christ on the Old Testament, you'll see all the colors and the beauty of it, and that it's exactly the same story as the New Testament. Now, there's much turbulence in the church and the world today, but if we are firmly grounded in God's will, God's purpose, which we see has been from the beginning and we're promised will last till the end, then we will not be disturbed by this turbulence. Our Lady has shown us in advance at Fatima with the great chastisement that would come from her son with reference to a bishop in white, pointedly not called the Pope. These are our days. You know, as the, uh, the introduction mentioned there, I spent uh, some months in prison in Burma trying to confront the tyranny there and also in a different way in North Korea. And in the following years, very slowly it dawned on me that the EU, the European Union, is becoming its own tyranny. And the United Kingdom, my own country, is becoming a tyranny where there is not free speech and not free movement and worship of God. And where there's so much cancelling of people. And then after that, I was totally amazed and slow to realize this tyranny has reached the church where people are cancelled, priests are cancelled, where the laity are denied the, or attempt to deny them the traditional mass. But tyranny exists to be defeated. It will all be defeated. In the meantime, it purifies us, strengthens us. We can enjoy the fight with nothing to fear. It's going to be a glorious victory. So to mention some of these signs of the times, the scandemic, where there are so many irrational, harmful measures around the world, and people being maimed and killed by this jab, and yet this information or discussion of it is censored. I just heard yesterday of, of a man who needs some almost almost life-saving treatment. He will live without it, but he'll be very, very sick, and it will be denied to him if he doesn't wear the mask, even today in the USA. And he refuses to wear the mask. What kind of madness is this to say this is health care, to wear a useless mask and deny him the treatment he needs? And so many in the States unjustly imprisoned over January the 6th you know, as Catholics, we're meant to care for the prisoners, all of them, guilty or not, but especially the innocent. And at best, you could say, these lies are from January 6th are from partisan ideologues who've lost all sense of judgment. They're so into their desperation for victory, they don't even know that they're lying. But worse, I think, those at the top, at least, they know it's not even meant to be a plausible accusation. It's meant to be outrageous, senseless, because that intimidates the whole population. And it's demoralizing and dispiriting when you know in your conscience you've bowed your head to it, and you've given up to it. Then the stolen election here in 2020. I was following that very closely from the UK. I've stood for the parliament in Westminster and the European Parliament before I realized they're totally tyrannical. So I, I know something about elections. And to watch that, and Trump was just about to win, it was almost irreversible, and then four states stopped counting. And there's never been an explanation for that other than a pipe burst somewhere. It's the best explanation that's given. Now, to be honest, I don't have the data and the facts of what exactly happened but I do know 
one is not meant to discuss it or there is outrage and that is the clearest sign that there is lies behind this and injustice and why is the priest talking about this <laughs> because we're supposed to care about people's bodily needs about food and clothing as priests as Catholics and if we care about food and clothing we care also about freedom about political goods which are even higher without which there won't be food and clothing Right, at every level, at every level. And we see if this tyranny continues, there will be more pro-lifers who are treated as enemies of the state. And Catholics should be defending the defenders of life. And because Satanists want war with Russia, Catholics are meant to renounce Satan and all his works and pomps, and that includes the warmongers. We don't all have to agree on what's behind all these things, the pandemic or Jan 6 or the stolen election or war with Russia. That's not the point. It's the obvious censorship that is the point, that is proof to any honest person that behind this is the devil, where discussion is forbidden because these people oppose truth. They're not interested in justice. They operate from the dark. And these things, they're all so crazy, so irrational, they're meant to distract us from the one thing that matters, from God and union with Him. They're being ramped up now, although they have hundreds of years of preparation for them, but they're being ramped up now to such a level that we shouldn't fear. It shows the desperation of the enemy who knows their time is short and I, I spent some time to give them in detail because they're a parallel to what is happening in the church you know our fight is a spiritual fight and what happens in that fight is made visible in the liturgy of the church and what happens in the liturgy of the church is made visible in the politics of the world the political catastrophes we see trace back to the liturgical catastrophes. We resist Satan because churches have been needlessly closed, even voluntarily closed by bishops, enthusiastically, perfidiously, godlessly. And regarding Traditionis Custodis, I just heard from a lady in the UK who's really beginning to doubt everything because it's just so shocking what is happening. It's utterly disordered, this idea of eradicating traditional worship. And yet men in positions of responsibility, I mean canon lawyers and people who work in chanceries and the bishops, they're taking this document seriously. That is so infantile. They are meant to be men they're meant to know their mission and to stand up for their mission. And instead, they're somehow either intimidated by Francis or infatuated with him, both of which are unbecoming for a man. <laughs> the similarities between the church and the state tyranny are a legal positivism and sycophancy. Instead of looking to the divine law and the natural law, there's this error that something becomes legally binding simply because the authority has said it, which is dictatorship. And the sycophancy is crawling up to some worldly power, which I cannot understand. If you're going to crawl up to any power, then let it be to God the Father. He's the only power that matters. To try to police Satan is always a mistake. Now, who is worse off? Sodomites or people who have abortions or bishops who ban the traditional Latin Mass? See, the Sodomites have some mitigating excuse on Judgment Day. Please, God, they will repent. 
But if not, at least the lust that drive them, this disordered lust, is some mitigation, some reason for what they did. And those who have had an abortion, or the abortionists themselves, please God they will repent. But at least there is some worldly fear sometimes there for the mother. I can't think of an excuse for the abortionists themselves. But for the bishops who ban the traditional mass, there is simply no excuse. It's completely unnecessary. They will go to hell if they don't repent. Their duty of care to the flock is greater than the duty of parents to their children. And they should know the traditional Mass is forever. How can it be that Pope Benedict says in 2007 that was once was held sacred cannot be all of a sudden considered harmful and even forbidden? How can they have forgotten what the Pope said 15 years ago. As a sign of slight hope, I think the greatest speech in the UK Parliament for a generation was given about a week ago by a member of Parliament called Danny Kruger. He said, In hindsight, I am particularly ashamed of my vote to dismiss care workers who did not want to receive the vaccine. I very much hope that the 40,000 care workers who lost their jobs can be reinstated and indeed compensated. It's very similar to what's happening in New York now. That's a member of parliament has stood up there and said not just he was wrong, but he's ashamed of what he did and that these people should be reinstated and compensated. And the fact of a member of parliament saying that, he, he risks being said upon but if he can stand his ground, that will help so many others to say the same thing. And that's what some of the bishops have to do now. Some of them admit that they've done wrong, not just with COVID, but with traditionists. Speak it clearly. And even if they go down, what a pleasing sacrifice to God and how it will strengthen the other bishops. You know, the Cultural Revolution in China from about 1966 to 76, they had a program to destroy the four olds, they called it, to destroy old ideas, old culture, old habits, old customs. This is the spirit that has entered the church about the same time, the mid-60s, to destroy what is old. It's as if the Vatican is learning from the Chinese Communist Party to destroy history and then populations can be manipulated because if you don't know where you come from then you don't know who you are and you don't know where you're meant to go and it becomes very easy to be misled if we know who we are and we know that the mass where we worship God goes all the way back not just to the crucifixion but back to paradise in the beginning then you will not be moved forever In England, people still believe today that Henry VIII was our most impressive king. They can't draw any insights between his murderous infidelity to his wives and his murderous infidelity to the church, to the faith of our fathers. Like his daughter Elizabeth I, he had tens of thousands of people put to death, probably reaching six figures in fact. And yet Elizabeth I is held up today as one who promoted religious tolerance, even though she had priests executed for offering Holy Mass. This 500-year-old lie continues because people do not want to admit that they've done wrong. But whatever the forces in the world, our protection does not depend upon the bishops. Our protection comes from God. We need to know our history especially worship in the Old Testament. And if we, if we study the Bible, both Old and New Testament, we will see it is unthinkable to swap out the altar for a table. It is unthinkable to remove the corpus of Christ from the cross. There might be some places where you have a simple cross, like on a, a book cover, but on the altar for Mass, his body must be there. It's unthinkable, if we read the Old Testament, for the laity today to touch the sacred vessels. 
including the chalice, much less to receive Holy Communion in the hand. It becomes unthinkable to stand during the canon of the Mass or to invade the sanctuary. If we read the Old Testament with love, we can't even propose a non-celibate or non-male priesthood. This isn't just because all the priests in the Old Testament were male, but there is a development, a tendency in it towards Christ, where, for example, you know the Jews couldn't just marry foreigners. They'd have to marry someone of their own tribe unless they had a dispensation. And among the Levites, the restrictions were um, even tighter, especially for those Levites who worked in the holy place. And for the high priest, he, like the Levites could marry a widow if she was the widow of another Levite. But the high priest couldn't marry anyone that was a widow or divorced. It had to be a virgin of the tribe of Levi. And you, there's a tendency to a greater celibacy. The higher you go up the hierarchy and the closer you get to Christ until he comes as the first on earth who lived celibacy for the kingdom of God. In fact, the traditional Latin mass is in perfect continuity, a perfect growth from the Old Testament. And to oppose it is to oppose God's purpose. We'll think of some themes then of the Old Testament, particularly sacrifice. You know, the life of the temple that stood in for a thousand years in Jerusalem was sacrifice. That was the purpose of it. With this huge altar outside the temple building in the first court and inside the holy place, an altar of incense. I explain that much more in the third book, but that altar of holocaust outside stands for christ on the cross and the altar of incense inside stands for our lady covered in gold like the ark of the covenant and a a a worship that is interior hidden and the incense grains it's like it, it burns and this sweet scent goes up to god so you offer your soul and a sacrifice to god and it's pleasing to him But sacrifice was the daily life of the temple with the lamb sacrificed in the morning and the evening. And before that, Moses' tabernacle in the desert was also for the daily sacrifice. It was with Moses and the exodus and the sacrifice of the paschal lamb that the nation of Israel was founded, as you like, as a nation, as a people. But their single founder was Abraham who in his willingness to sacrifice his son was unique in God's eyes. And long before him, Abel offered a lamb to God. Even Cain offered a sacrifice, which wasn't pleasing, but I don't think Cain was copying Abel or Abel copying his elder brother Cain. They both probably got it from their father, Adam, the first man to offer sacrifice to God. This has been with us through all time. If anyone wants to do away with sacrifice, to swap an altar for a table, they're going against that fundament that God has laid in to creation from the beginning. And all these sacrifices connected with the Lamb of God, who we know as Christ. Or the cross. You know, in the canon of the Mass, there are 25 crosses that the priest makes over the sacred gifts. 25. In the Novus Ordo, one that is a diabolical aversion to the cross I don't mean each priest who says the Novus Ordo because that's how they've been formed or trained but whoever came up with the Novus Ordo whoever thought we can strike out 96% of the crosses from the canon of the mass it's an aversion to the cross but the Old Testament is full of it so as mentioned this book Adam's Deep Sleep is about 16 sleeps in the Old Testament which all point to the passion of Christ. Moses on the mountain with his arms outstretched so his people won the battle is Christ on the cross. Samson with his arms outstretched so the temple of the enemy collapsed is Christ on the cross. The high priest with his arms outstretched and raised in prayer is Christ on the cross. They all point to the mighty arm of God which delivers his people the outstretched arm of God. 
And just think of a tree, the tree of life there in Eden. We, we sing in the Easter Triduum is uh, the, the most beautiful tree on which hangs this precious fruit, the body of Christ. Then later in the desert, the Hebrews saw trees as a sign of life. We told the 70 palm trees and the 12 springs of water. We heard earlier, water is the sign of grace. They're in these 12 pools that stand for the 12 tribes or the 12 apostles who give this grace to 70 trees, palm trees. 70 stands for all the nations of the world. So all the world gets life, grace, through the apostles, through the church, and their palm trees standing for victory, standing for sacrifice through the wood of the tree, which is the cross. If you carry your cross, you will have this life. And this is a sign of life in the desert without which you die. Psalm 1, the very first psalm, says, The just man is like a tree which is planted near the running waters. That's living water, not dead water, which is grace. Which shall bring forth its fruit in due season. In due season was about 4,000 years later after the planting of the first tree to Christ on the cross and then it brought forth its fruit then was the season and his leaf shall not fall off this will endure forever or what comes from a tree think of uh, the various staffs we read in the Bible you know Jacob crossed the Jordan and the scripture tells us carrying only his staff that's all he had why does scripture say this one of the church fathers says Jacob boasted of crossing the Jordan with only his staff. What is the boast? The river Jordan stands for the boundary between the Holy Land and the rest. It's a, an image for death because you cross over it, you go through death. Remember the Jordan River stopped for the Ark of the Covenant. It's that that God's presence stops death. But Jacob crossed it with his staff. That staff stands for the cross. And if, it, if you're not convinced, we can name half a dozen other staffs where it's clear it is the cross. Moses' staff is what separated the Red Sea. With his staff in hand, the scripture tells us, as Jesus' hand affixed to the cross, so that the, God's people could be delivered from their enemies and from death. Aaron's staff is the, the rod that the 12 uh, of the 12 tribes of Israel all put their rods out and it was found the next day that Aaron's had budded. So you get life from death, which again is the cross, and it identified him as the true high priest, the Levite. Aaron is the first high priest in that line. We read of Banias, he was one of the 30, a valiant man, who with a rod forced the spear out the hand of the giant Egyptian and slew him with his own spear. The Egyptian stands for the world and this rod that Bananias went down with is the cross. To defeat the Egyptian with his own spear it means the weapon of the enemy turns back on himself and defeats him. You'll see all those who oppose the TLM or the globalists trying to control the world population it's their own schemes that will destroy them. We have to be patient. Patient, Jesus said, in your patience you will save your souls. It doesn't just mean wait it out. Patience means to suffer. We have to bear the cross. But they will destroy themselves. In fact, St. Gregory of Nyssa writes, when in the scriptures, whenever you read wood, we should think of the cross. And it's on pretty much every page of the Old Testament. Pretty much. Or certainly the crucifixion is there on every page one way or another. So I'll give one example that you can find 20 times in the Old Testament of wood. And when you hear this, think of the cross. From Leviticus 6, And the fire on the altar shall always burn, and the priest shall feed it, putting wood on it every day in the morning, and laying on the holocaust, shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. This is the perpetual fire which shall never go out on the altar. But that altar was destroyed in 70 AD 
so how is God's promise true? Because it's talking of holy mass. That's the altar. And the wood is the wood of the cross. And the fire is the Holy Spirit. And it comes so often, this laying of the, the Holocaust on the wood with the fire. Or you know, Elisha threw a stick into a river to recover an axe that had fallen in. That stick is the cross. Because the river is water, which as well as meaning life also means death. And the axe had sunk in there. And when they recovered the axe, which is also wood, they were able to build the houses for the prophets. The houses for the prophets means the church, which they build by sharing in the wood of the cross. But it was one man, Elisha, with his staff, or Jesus with the cross, that made that possible for us to share in the cross and build the church. Or to think in other terms, we go right back to Adam. There's some key things told to us about Adam and Eve. For example, that their marriage is indissoluble. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. We, we see that attacked in the last 500 years with divorce, since people like Henry VIII, until it becomes so commonplace. But Adam and Eve were given to each other for the sake of procreation, to multiply. In the last 100 years, we've seen contraception spreading more and more. It's always been there, but especially the last 100 years. And the complementarity of male and female is stressed at the beginning of Genesis. Man and woman, he made them, which I used to think was such a redundant line. It was like, well, yeah. But today, boy, that's <laughs> it's breaking news. <laughs> but this, this marriage of Adam and Eve is an image of Christ and the church. The procreation to have many children is because God wants to have many children for eternity, not just the population of this planet. And the complementarity of man and woman, male and female, speaks of the union of God with us, his creatures. The, the male stands for the divinity, the female for humanity. Even the Greeks knew this hundreds of years before Jesus that the, the male is somehow divine. And if you say that now, people think you're being sexist. Um, that's so shallow. We're trying to talk about God. And God's written that into man and woman. Men are bigger and stronger, right? A little bit bigger than women. <laughs> A little bit stronger. But that's to show us that God is infinitely great and strong. Um, and all of us, being creatures, being human, we relate as female to God. We receive from Him. We come from Him, as Eve from Adam. I just, everything you read about Adam and Eve in such few words is so full of meaning for today. And in fact, Genesis 1 spends so much time talking about trees. <laughs> it's amazing. Every word is precious, but they don't mind repeating again and again about the trees that God planted, which would bring forth seed according to its kind. The tree is the cross. The seed is the body of Christ, which brings the fruit, or it's the fruit also, to bring forth sons of God like Jesus, us, in baptism. And all this in Genesis 1, he's talking already about what will come, the cross and the multiplication of children that God through his son would adopt millions of us there's also aberrant, aberrant worship in the Old Testament the offering of child sacrifices which today is happening on a scale like never before through abortion and Francis appointing advocates of abortion to the Pontifical Academy for Life. If the church doesn't defend life, it is impossible for politicians. It's just they're in a much more vicious arena than the bishops, although the bishops is a spiritual violence. Um, but we can't expect the politicians to pass good laws if the bishops aren't upholding the teaching of the church. Not everybody who supports abortion 
is a Satanist. I think only a few of them are. But everyone who supports abortion is serving Satan. And not everyone who gives or receives Holy Communion in the hand is a Satanist. I think only very, very few of them are. But everybody who gives or receives Holy Communion in the hand is ultimately serving Satan. Think of the new instruction to stand in Mass during the canon. Where did that come from? It is from the devil. What else does it mean, this unheard of, unnecessary innovation? Who thought to introduce it? It totally clashes with the Old Testament where we see Abraham bowing down before God. Or Samson's parents when they realized the person they were speaking to was the angel of the Lord. The scriptures tell us they fell flat on the ground in the presence of the angel of the Lord. And shall we stand when our Lord comes down to the altar? The scriptures tell us of Daniel bowing down just in the direction of Jerusalem when he was in exile in Babylon. But so much reverence for the holy place is to bow down from there. And will we not bow down when we're in the same room as God? There's the reverence for God's presence in Moses removing his shoes before the burning bush. And the holy ones who would go alone, you know, before Abraham took his son Isaac up Mount Moriah, he dismissed his servants. They had to stand far off. Or when Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting, the others would stand back. And will people invade the sanctuary in Holy Mass? Indeed, when the tent in the desert and when the, tab uh, the temple in Jerusalem were dedicated, it says nobody could enter in because of the presence of the Lord. Nobody. And then, after some time, the priests could come to do their work. So much more reverence should we have for the sanctuary in the church. And yet we see invasions and people touching the sacred vessels. And a refusal to give Holy Communion to people who kneel to receive on the tongue. A couple of weeks ago, a lady in California told me about a priest refusing her communion because she knelt. This is the first time it's happened to her. And she said he had a smirk on his face when he was doing it. It's like a power trip for him. And he makes it obvious that he's a homosexual. I wonder if he wants to spread his unbelief. Because it's impossible to believe in the real presence and to treat the Lord so unworthily. And he wants to force others into the sacrilege. There's a woman in Switzerland, Monica Schmidt, was recently filmed standing at the altar during the canon, reciting some version of the Eucharistic prayer. But apparently it had been adjusted, whatever as if she's con-celebrating the Mass. And she said, defending her actions, the liturgical reform in Vatican II would not have been possible in this way, meaning a woman there saying the words of consecration. If individual priests in their parishes, university chaplains with their students, had not turned away from the high altar years before the Council and celebrated the Eucharist with the people in view in their native language, Totally forbidden, of course, liturgical abuse. I can't pronounce the next words, but she's basically laughing at that. It was the same with women lectors or female altar servers. She's saying basically because of the rebellion before the council to just do these things, then it becomes possible everywhere. And she thinks this is progress and good. And in fact, she's received support from all over Switzerland, including from clerics and bishops. This is a disintegration and the, the clerics are most at fault. There were two priests present who weren't vested for Mass. They were only wearing stoles, I think, um, plus a deacon wearing a rainbow stole. And so if these priests love the Old Testament, it is unthinkable to say Mass not vested properly. When you hear about the vestments of Aaron, 
there's no time to go into it now, but it's so beautiful and meaningful, the vestments that he wore. And God even vested, it says, Adam and his wife after they tried to make clothes for themselves out of leaves and God gave them clothes out of skins, which is to do with sacrifice, by the way. But it says Adam and his wife. It doesn't name Eve. I think that's a very subtle way of prefiguring the male priesthood. What does this show us, though, of the Novus Ordo? If you accept the Novus Ordo is valid, and it, it may well be, then I think the traditional Mass and the Novus Ordo, they are both the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary. But what do you see when you look at the crucifixion? You see the most beautiful and the most terrible thing that ever happened on this planet. If you look with the eyes of the Spirit, you see the most beautiful thing, the love of God for us, the self-sacrifice of His Son. And this the traditional Mass brings out in all the majesty and beauty of the Mass. But if you look at the body and see all those gashes and the blood and the thorns and the nails, you see the most terrible and ugly sacrilege and blasphemy that's ever happened. And this, I think, the Novus Ordo puts before our eyes. By no means, though, should we think of banning the Novus Ordo or wishing for that, even as they try to ban the traditional Mass. I'll give three reasons. If, you, if the Novus Ordo were banned, then you would suddenly have a lot of priests trying to say the traditional Mass who don't love it and don't know it, and they would be saying it with the casual spirit of the Novus Ordo, and that would be horrific. It would also be an injustice to people who've grown up with the Novus Ordo and been told this is their worship. You can't take that away in a day. Even God was so patient with the Jews after the crucifixion. He gave them 40 years more where they could still go to the temple till they figured out that all that pointed to Jesus. He gave them a whole generation to work it out. So it would be an injustice to take away the Novus Ordo in a day as some wish to remove the traditional Mass. And also because in 100 or 300 years time or however long the world has left it will be much better that it be seen the Novus Ordo died out by itself because it's sterile people lost interest just let any priest say the old mass and within a generation they'll all be doing it and there's the proof of its goodness so there's likely a schism coming it's not going to be between the traditional mass and the Novus Ordo they're not the two opposed camps. It's between tradition and sodomy, as far as I can work out. The Novus Ordo is just a staging post on the way to that. That's what they want, where anything goes against God's law. So if trying to discern in a schism where one should be, don't look to externals like who has the best churches or who has the most money or who has the most bishops. Simply stay with tradition. It's enough. You don't need to call the schism. You don't need to say, well, today it's happened and it's this side and this side. It's not our job. We just need to stay with tradition. It's enough. The reason I say that sodomy is the opposer's tradition, you know, St. Jude, wh whose feast was a couple of days ago in his letter, speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah and how the men then and then in his day who give themselves to fornication, then he says, going after other flesh, which is even worse than sodomy because you would have thought he might say the same flesh would be human flesh he says other flesh it's probably animals and he says these men defile the flesh despise dominion blaspheme majesty he says sodomy is a blasphemy against God because the male female union is that image of Christ in the church of God's union with us which is the whole plan of creation which is seeded in the incarnation where you have the union, perfect union of divine and human in the person of Christ. And he wants to make us members of his body. Whereas a male-male encounter is as if to say God is not interested in his creatures. And a female-female encounter is as if to say humans are not interested in God. They're blasphemies against his plan. If we search the Old Testament, 
in the light of the new? Or let me ask, how many of you love Abraham? How many would say you love Moses? How many love David? Great, you understand the Old Testament. <laughs> you do. That's why it's there. So we love these men. Because they stand for the Father, Son and Spirit. Now they're separated by about 400 years each, just to show us the distinction of persons. But Abraham is the patriarch. He is the father of nations, willing to sacrifice his son. I, I, time is running out. I just want to talk about Abraham. You know, I've been kicked out of loads of parishes. Every time I leave, I have the same homily. And it, <laughs> it begins and ends with love Abraham. Really, no joke. That's the most important thing I have to say anywhere before I get kicked out. I, I can't tell you how gracious that man in his negotiation for the field were to bury Sarah, his wife. Or when he offered to Lot, he said, which side do you want? Pick and you can take that land. And Lot chose the wrong side. Abraham got the Holy Land. But this, the two greatest things that he did were his leaving home and his willingness to offer his son. And they are an image of the incarnation of Christ coming down from heaven and dying on the cross. And then Moses, who after the golden calf prayed and said, I beseech thee, God, this people has sinned a heinous sin and they have made to themselves gods of gold. Either forgive them this trespass or if you do not, strike me out of the book you have written. Moses was willing to die for his people. And God loved Moses so much he spared them so he could spare Moses. There was a plague so there was a punishment. But there's no one in the Old Testament who puts us more in mind of Jesus Christ than Moses. And then David, you know, with his music, could soothe the demons from Saul. And he wrote the Psalms. And Jesus says it was in the Spirit he wrote the Psalms. There's been no one in the entire Old Testament so inspired by the Holy Spirit as David. Really, with these three, you have the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I have to choose between the sections for the end, but I'm going to try and do it all. Just Psalm 113, it's the last psalm of Sunday Vespers. When the traditional Mass is restored, we need to restore Sunday Vespers as well. If you hear Psalm 113 every week, you will fall in love with it. And what is it all about? It says, when Israel went out of Egypt, and it mentions the sanctuary, think of the church, the sea saw and fled, the Jordan was turned back, the mountains skipped like rams and hills like lambs of the flock. He says the sea saw them leaving. How can the sea see? It says the mountains skipped like rams. I mean, really, I'll explain what I mean by really another day, but <laughs> that the psalm then says, What ail of thee, O thou sea, that thou didst flee, and thou, O Jordan, that thou wast turned back? He's asking questions to the sea and the river. And ye mountains that ye skip like lambs and ye hills like lambs of the flock. He's asking questions to the mountains and hills as if they can see and hear and answer as if they're persons almost, as if they're rational. Can creation become rational? The earth? Yes, that's what God did with Adam. He took him from the slime of the earth, made a man. It's what happens in the Holy Eucharist where you get bread and it becomes God. At the presence of the Lord, the earth was moved. The presence of the God of Jacob. Right at the beginning we said the earth can't be moved, but yes, by the presence of God, everything can be moved at the level of substance, the deepest metaphysical level. Who turned rock into pools of water and stony hills into fountains of water. Our God is in heaven. He has done whatever he wants, including changing bread and wine into the body and blood of his son. It talks about the idols of the Gentiles of stone and silver and gold. They have mouths but can't speak. They have eyes but can't see. And let those who worship them become like them. If you worship things which have eyes but can't see or ears that but can't hear, that's these things, you will become like them. If you worship artificial intelligence, you will become as dumb as that, as soulless, as in, irrational. But if you worship the Blessed Sacrament, you will become like God, which was the promised to Adam and Eve they that fear the Lord have hoped in the Lord he is their helper and protector through everything 
The Lord has been mindful of us and has blessed us. He's blessed the house of Israel. He's blessed the house of Aaron. That's the traditional Catholics, if we stay, stay true. Bless, blessed be you of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Is reminding us of Genesis. And you know, a tree is basically a machine for transubstantiation, right? Which is the greatest one on earth. What does a tree do? It takes soil and turns it into the sweetest fruit. In the soil, it's in darkness. It's all clamped together. There's worms crawling about. That's an image for this world. We have all that. Look, look to Washington, D.C. <laughs> or, or Westminster. Um, but the tree, which is the cross, draws it up and turns it into the sweetest fruit, which is the Holy Eucharist. It was the body of Christ originally, but it's full of all sweetness and wisdom. And a tree does that. It's amazing. How? Just using the being that it received from God or also gets from the soil and light and water. Standing for the light is the truth of Christ, the water is the grace of the Holy Spirit, and its own being is the gift of the Father, which it gets from the soil. Every single tree is a miracle trying to tell us the reason of creation and the course of history, that you take dirt and turn it into something sweet as Christ. And that's us. We're, we're that dirt, sinners, to be transformed by the cross if we accept the cross. And finally, that Psalm 103, which was the last psalm today in the Divine Office in Sext, which I began with, um, it, has, it says, Who founded the earth on, on its uh, basis, it will never be moved. Then later talks about, He has put the limits to water which it will never cross. Water stands here for death and evil. And just as you know, the sea will never rise above the mountains or the coast. That's an image for us not to fear evil. God has set a limit to it that it cannot cross. And it, it, the same psalm, that the fruits of thy works will cover the whole earth. That's the blessed sacrament. The traditional mass will be restored. Who draws bread from the earth and wine to give joy to the heart, which is the Holy Eucharist, right? This... Um, Bread from the earth, you know, the corn that grows from the soil also that then gets turned into bread, that then gets turned into God. It makes that itinerary. It's not just us that get transformed to God. But he lifts up creation that dirt can become corn, can become bread, can become God. Amazing how he raises it up with his presence. Uh, and if he removes his spirit, we return to the dust. That's where we came from. Without him, we go back to the dust. We will in death. But if we're united with him in our soul, in our spirit, we'll get our body back and live forever. Who looks on the earth and makes it to shake. Who touches the mountains and they smoke. God alone can move the substance of things. Until the sinners um, die out from the earth. And as if they were not. Bless my soul, the Lord. So the enemies will be overcome. And that last words of the psalm oh, bless my soul the Lord are also the first words of the psalm the same psalm it begins and ends with the same words that's creation Garden of Eden and the heavenly liturgy same thing right in the middle the crucifixion so if we ask today looking at the world of the church what shall we do read the Old Testament in the light of the new and that will give stability to our standing so our mind cannot be moved so that we can attach ourselves to this stability, live in it, which is the sacrifice. It is the cross. It is the Son of God, our Redeemer. God bless you all.